Hey everybody, welcome to the show. It is Sunday, August 16th, 2020. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Dillon. Joined this week, Jim Barrows. How are you, Jim? Uh, doing pretty good. Cool. For a Sunday on a weekend? Yeah, you know, weekend. After a super hot day yesterday? Yeah, How, how's the boat? Boat uh, floats, doing good. Float? Um, almost too hot to work on her last yesterday, but fortunately most of that was inside where I had an AC in it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. So a uh, quick update. Uh, obviously, we're still doing the show remotely. That is going to continue probably almost certainly for the rest of the year and well into next year. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, Austin Travis County had been on basically stay at home orders, shelter in place, however you want to describe it. Uh, and that was set that actually expired last night uh, on August 15th. However, it's been renewed and extended through December 15th. So if you're in the Austin Travis County area area, you still have to wear a mask and um, you should shelter in place anybody who can. You, please go out to the, uh, the government website so you can find out exactly what the mayor's instructions were if you live in the Austin area. But it hasn't stopped our shows one bit. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we've we been doing a lot of stuff. I want to go through the, the standard kind of uh, announcements that we've got going here. First of all, if you're watching us live on YouTube, we're no longer using Super Chat at all. If you scroll up directly above the chat message, you'll see a donate button there. And because we're a nonprofit, uh, you, any, any money that you donate to the ACA through that link, all of it goes to the ACA. YouTube doesn't take a cut. Google doesn't take a cut. Uh, it's great. And it's done wonders for us. We're incredibly grateful to everybody who's been supporting both with that donation link and for people who supported by buying merchandise, which uh, they'll have a screenshot up in a minute with a website where you can go and actually get a Theist Experience Network merch. It's bit.ly slash AEN merch. Uh, you can also join and become a member on the YouTube channel, or you can go to Patreon and become a member there as well, or one or the other or both or all of them. It doesn't matter. We appreciate everybody's support and every dollar that comes in to helps continue to promote the mission the ACA is doing. We're going to continue to produce content and have amazing guests and our regular co-hosts on uh, across the board on all the shows because we are being helped by the probably the best crew on the planet constantly. Uh, there they are right there. Screening your calls, adjusting audio, adjusting video. There's a cat that is secretly in charge of all of us, I think. Um, but that's what we've been doing. And by the way, if you missed it, my my friend, Objectively Dan, who does the Truth Wanted show on Friday nights, did a, a remarkable show um, yesterday on, on this past Friday that I think, hopefully, uh, some of you would like to go see. Because his guest on Truth Wanted was John Delancey who played Q on Star Trek The Next Generation, along with a lot of other parts, who is a secular activist. And they sat around and had some conversation, took some questions, and interacted with callers. So if you haven't checked out Truth Wanted, by all means, be sure you do. And don't miss that special episode from Friday. Uh, I'm also told that uh, Talk Heathen had Trey Crowder on today. So we've, we've got this kind of rotation going through where we have regular co-hosts involved in the various shows and then guests. And we, it's very likely we will have a guest on Atheist Experience uh, next week as well. We're still finalizing details and all the people behind the scenes are, are working far harder than I am. I just kind of, like I, I used to talk about how I'd just show up at the building and talk and now I don't even go to the building. Like I might not even have pants on as far as most of you are, are concerned. And so Jim and I are uh, sheltering at home in our different homes and uh, we're pleased that you're joining us this week. Jim, do you have any announcements or things that you wanted to get out of the way before we start taking callers? Uh, no, not really. Um, well, you know, I, I could make a challenge to uh, some some theologians out there um, because I have noticed that sites like IFL Science and other science uh, science news sites always have something new almost every day. And some of it's minor, you know. Most of the time, it's minor stuff. We discovered this new animal. We did, you know, this new species. This species we thought was uh, the same as this other isn't. Uh, minor little discoveries in almost every branch of science we have. So my thought was, or my question is, what has theology done for us lately? And just minor, something minor. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything like put a man on the moon, um, shatter the atom. It doesn't have to be anything that groundbreaking. Just something minor, say, in the last hundred years. That's actually outstanding. I I'll be generous. Yeah, give it, give them an what, entire what century to tell us what what good theology has done for humanity in the last century, 
or just what have they done to advance our knowledge of a god, multiple gods, supernatural, wide wide open? What what yeah. have they done to advance? Knowledge? Now, I would I would assume because I I had a similar challenge once upon a time, and people would come in and say, "Oh, well, my church donated to this." No, no, that's people doing something good, not a religion doing something good. And that's not actually advancing our knowledge of anything supernatural or of God. Yeah. For instance, have they done any randomized double blind studies on the effectiveness of prayer for anything, whether it's, you know, little Johnny getting a bike for his birthday or curing cancer for anybody? That'd be really handy. I mean, I've always been annoyed at the various uh, faith healing people who draw a big crowd into their revival tent and flash their coats around and knock people over and all that other stuff. And yet, um, why don't they just go in from hospital to hospital, you know? Right. Yeah. And I know like Mayo Clinic's done a, a randomized double blind and, and a couple other places have done it. But the question I have is, were the, the people doing the praying just not Christian enough? Didn't they believe right? Did they not pray right? Yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of questions that as a theologian, I think you'd want answered. And yet... We don't hear about any of this. We just hear more preachers spewing the same old stuff. We've had the same calls for what this this last fifteen years. Twenty three. Um, yeah, twenty three. I mean, I've only been taking calls uh, for fifteen years, but we've been doing it for twenty three, and I'm pretty sure in the early days they got the same stuff. Right. And honestly, the only difference between uh, our callers and say William Leg Craig or Eric Hovind or any other apologist like that is they're better spoken about their topic, not that the arguments are any better. So anyway, that's my challenge. I would, I would like to know what has, where has theology and theologians actually advanced our knowledge of God that they all agree on. We want the same standard for physics or biology or any of that, any other topic. So, yeah, we got to be a little cautious. That'll be interesting because to see if we... You know, the the reason I was exercising caution is because uh, they have started to put together their own, air quotes, peer-reviewed journals, uh, which I find incredibly amusing. But Well, I'm not talking about, yeah, I'm not talking about the creationist museum doing their creationist stuff. Uh, specifically, what do we know about God today that we didn't know 100 years ago? And it can be minor. Yeah. Be minor. How, how do we, know? do we know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so All right. good luck. Uh, good luck. Yeah, call in. Uh, our call screeners are waiting, but we have like way more than normal full lines. So let's start getting in on this. We've got uh, Rick in California. You're on the air with Jim and Matt. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How, how are you guys doing? Not bad. Yeah, pretty good. Hey, hey um, I just had a quick question, actually. Um, uh, my question was about um, scripture where it says... Ask, um, ask in my name, and it shall be added unto you if you pray. Um, I've done that. <laughs> I've done that so many times, and uh, obviously, I, it, I obviously come to the conclusion of it's not real. And um, I just was wondering if that, if you guys asked for a revelation from Jesus or asked him to reveal himself to you, uh, you know, I just want to know how uh, how that was for you guys. Well, we're still atheists. I mean, yeah. it, it's worked out about that well. Um, and I think you just heard my opening comment about, you know, what have we done lately to expand our, our knowledge of God? And, you know, we hear that all the time. Uh, pray and, it will, you know, seek and you shall find. Well, I know Matt has gone into great detail about his seeking. I've done it. Um, and we're still waiting for the evidence. Yeah, I mean... Anybody who thinks that I just up and decided to stop being a Christian one day for no good reason or without trying to uh, have a discussion with God, I, I don't know what to tell you. But, but yes, I've done what you've asked. I've done it many, many times. I did it while I was still a believer and got no answer. I did it after, you know, the number of people who email or call in, or especially early on in the time that I was on the show, who'd be like, well, have you tried? Because it says it says if you reach out to God with, you know, and an, uh, your heart's in the right place and everything else, that God will reveal himself to you. And I'm like, that is actually one of the most insulting things that people can possibly say. Because for some reason, the God that they believe in seems perfectly comfortable helping 
Jim Bob find his car keys and helping, you know, um, fix things that are being treated with medicine. And yet, if I ask a God, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm trying to do what you want. I'm trying to be the sort of Christian you'd like me to be. Uh, could you give me a little help here? And I get nothing repeatedly over and over again. And then what happens is the theists come in, they say, ah, but that's because God has given you over to a reprobate mind. Your heart's not in there. You, you, you didn't sincerely ask God. And I'm just like, screw you. How dare you? See, what right. they're saying when they say this, they don't know how sincere I was or wasn't. They just believe that it's not possible for them to be wrong. And so if it didn't work for me, it must be my fault. Well, go fuck yourself. I mean, that's I'm legitimately, and I'm saying that as nicely and politely as can. Not to you, obviously, Rick, but I'm saying if, if, you're, if your response to somebody is, this, this will work, and this is how you introduce yourself with, to God, and this is how God will reveal himself to you, and then you do it, and it doesn't work, and they're like, ah, you didn't do it right. Well, yeah, go away. It, it, it is, you know, right. please demonstrate the truth of the proposition. So, yeah, we've done that. Right. I, I always, whenever I do it, because I, you know, it's, um, you know, these are my roots, you know, that I was born in this. Uh, I'm sure just like you, Matt and, and Jim. And, um, you know, once I started questioning and found out that it wasn't real, every single time that I was, you know, even today, I'll still pray every once in a while when I get that feeling like, you know, maybe, maybe it can be true. And whenever I pray, nothing happens. I don't imagine God slash Jesus in heaven saying, eh, I don't think I'm going to do it. Even though I wrote in that book, in my book that I will do it, I'm not going to. Like, I yeah. just don't, I don't see how that's possible. And that, that thing just really, uh, I guess love really comes into it because how, how can judgment day come and, and I'm over here saying, hey, I, I did call out to you and yeah. I, I came to the conclusion that this isn't real. So I guess that stuff just keeps replaying in my mind. But um, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Matt. You know, appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rick. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Yeah. It's one of those things, that's you know, really. Go ahead, Jim. Um, on that note, there's a, as a software engineer, there's a trick that we sometimes use um, that has been nicknamed Talk to the Doc. Because one of the things we've noticed is that when we have a problem we can't really solve, we'll sometimes go and talk to somebody about it. And as soon as we explain what it is, we get hit with the answer. Um, and so the advice sometimes is before you talk to somebody else and interrupt their day, talk to the doc. And it's a metaphor for talk to your screen, talk to yourself, and actually say the problem out loud so that you know what the problem is. So if you're praying and you get an answer about a problem you're having what i'd like to know is how do you know that's not you solving the problem because explaining it can solve the problem for you yeah. and i have anecdotal multiple anecdotal evidences for that um there may actually be a study done i don't know um but it's a fairly common tactic in my field um that i've seen and heard of from many people and i do it myself so how do you know that's not you versus god and how do you know it's God's voice? Because I can't tell the difference. It sure sounds like me. Yeah. I, I have a lot of difficulty with that too. But the others are that, you know, there are some specific, there are verses that that say, okay, I'll do whatever you ask, provided it's within the scope of what God wants to do. But there's others where it's like, wherever two or more of you are gathered together in my name, whatever you ask for, I will do. And so that means that no two sincere believers have ever gotten together and prayed for world peace or an end of poverty or an end of hunger or whatever else. And, and in order to... to to come up with an apologetic for that, they must then say, ah, that verse does not mean what it explicitly says. Instead, it just means, hey, if this is within my plan, I'll do it. Well, then why the fuck did we bother asking? The, the only thing right. that anybody should ever say is, God, go ahead and do what is ever in your plan, uh, which why would they even bother saying that? It's not like they can stop a God from doing what's in their plan. So it's why yeah. include this passage at the beginning? Why include it at all if it's just going to be obviously not true to, you know, in, in the way yeah. it's presented? Yeah. Very, yeah. It's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery wrapped in enigma and blah, blah, blah. We've got uh, Aaron in Wisconsin. You're on with Matt and Jim. How are you? Hey, Matt and Jim. Doing fine. How are you guys doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. 
So I called in today because I wanted to discuss morality primarily as it relates to theism versus atheism. Um, okay. And I well, understand that atheism doesn't speak directly to morality. It's a non-belief or a belief that you know, there isn't enough evidence for belief in God. But part of the reason that I am a theist rather than an atheist is this big question of morality. And and I was kind of hoping you guys could kind of give me an idea of what you think your basis for morality is. Obviously, well, you know what mine is. Cause I well, no, I, I don't. I don't. And that's that's the confusing thing. So I'm, I'm happy to do oh, that. That's and true. I'm happy to do that, but you're, you're saying theism versus atheism. Well, theism has absolutely nothing to say about morality, not a bit. So in order for you to have some, some version of theistic morality, you have to cite what the source for that morality is and what, what the rules and the foundation are. But theism is not a position on morality at all. It doesn't take one. Similarly, atheism doesn't take a position on morality. All right. Yeah, when you say theism, I don't even know if you're a polytheist or a monotheist. Yeah. And if you're a monotheist, what version what brand of monotheism are you? Right? Uh we know that there's Christian, Jewish, and Islam, and I'm sure there's probably a couple I'm missing. <laughs> um if you say you're a Christian, there's two thousand different varieties of Christians. Um Islam, there's at least two major sects. Um Judaism, there's multiple sects as well. So you're making a category error in that we see quite a bit. So when you say theist, I mean, exactly, I, you know, are you poly, mono? If you're mono, which one, you know, where do you fall on that spectrum? So you are completely right. Um, so I'm a monotheist, I'm a Christian, um, but I will also state that I do not believe a lot of what's in the Bible. And I know that's kind of difficult, but I, as you understand, there's so many denominations and so many different interpretations on that. But what well, I find if you don't believe being a Christian, I'm sorry, Aaron. If you don't believe everything in the Bible, what is what is your criteria for determining what things in the Bible you're going to believe and what you're not going to believe? Um, so my criteria is what I rationally understand and can agree with in terms of. Okay, so you're the ultimate foundation. You're the ultimate source about right and wrong for you. Because if the Bible says something is right that you think is wrong, you're going to reject that. If it says something's wrong that you think is right, you're going to reject that too. So how is your, how is your, your moral foundation anything other than this is just what I think? Um, well, I think that there is a general morality understood to be in the Bible about a lot of things. Um, yeah, like slavery is okay. Are you good with slavery? Yeah. I am not okay with slavery. That's well. One. Then you're you're standing in opposition to the Bible and whether or not it's morally permissible to own people as property. So, what criteria did you use for that? If you just want to say there's this general view of what's right and wrong within Christianity, um, that's kind of true, and yet you're not accepting all of it, which means that you've set yourself up as your own authority on morality, and that's fine. Well, I agree. I, I think that I use my reason to look at things in the Bible in addition to the Bible as kind of a standard. So I, I think you would agree that there's a lot of things in the Bible that you would agree with are moral in general, at least our society agrees with. There's a few things that I, I mean, let's not kill people. I'm good with that one. I mean, if you listed off the okay. first 10 commandments, um, the first five of them are, are religious prescriptions. They have nothing to do with morality at all. And of the rest of them, um, apart from murder, murder. I mean, it's okay to lie. Uh, perjury is 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 against the law, but that may or may not be immoral, considering on the circumstances. Uh, we live in. I live in the United States, and my nation was built on coveting and trying to keep up with the Joneses. And so, when we take a look at what the Bible wants to say is sinful, um, is it okay to eat shellfish? Is it okay to cut your hair? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, so shellfish, cutting your hair, are men uh, superior to women? Is it okay for women to own property? I mean, all of these things are, are views the Bible puts forward that I wholeheartedly reject. Like, do you think it's immoral for two people who are not married to have sex? No, I don't think so. And yet the Bible seems to be opposed to that. What about two people of the same gender having sex? I think that's fine. Yeah, me too. So 
what, what morality within Christianity that you think is the norm are you appealing to? Because right now, you and I are way closer to the same page than you are to any page in the Bible. And I agree with that. I think that there's a lot of denominations in Christianity, and a lot of them, as you know, have different thoughts on what the Bible says and what they believe. For me, I, my main issue, the, I, just so you know, I've been, I was raised Christian, theism. I became an atheist. I switched back to theism because I could not find some sort of grounding in morality that would explain societal rules would explain how I'm supposed to go through this life. And I agree well, that a lot of things in the Bible that aren't great, but at least it has some sort of base shared morality uh, that, that you reject to go by. Come on now. Right. Not all you're you're yeah. rejecting and it. Okay. Let's, let's pick one, Aaron, let's pick one we agree with. Let's pick, um, thou shalt not murder. Because I'm, I'm assuming you're opposed to murdering. Can you define murder? Can you define murder? Are you talking about well, killing or like murdering for, I mean, because there's different, I mean, even our society has different reasons for murder. Sure, murder is a specific legal definition. It's, it's, it's li literally the unjustified killing, which means your society is deciding what's, but let's, let's pick a scenario. If Jim were to come over right now and lop my head off just because he felt like it, um, I think I would find that to be immoral. I would think you would find that to be immoral. I think even Jim would find that to be immoral, but he might want to do it. I, I agree. Well, Matt, you are a lizard person, and that is the only way to kill a lizard You're not supposed to say that while we're live on the air. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Shh, shh, all right, so Jim comes over and lops my head off just because he feels like it. We are all in agreement that that is immoral. Does it matter whether or not the Bible thinks it's immoral? No, I don't think it does. Congratulations. I have no reason. You to... just undermined your entire argument. You and I both have an understanding about this from our own reason. And what the Bible has to say about it is irrelevant. So your fear that you're going to have a morality that isn't founded or it doesn't have some grounding that led you to a theistic model because that can serve as your grounding. The great lie here is that you need some sort of external grounding. I don't agree. We get, I think you knew that I would think that was immoral, but I have no reason why, I have no understanding of why you think it's immoral. I don't, I don't think you have a better, any better reason than I do because your Bible doesn't advocate for it. Well, so I, I use no, no, no. So, happiness of the population. Go ahead, Jim. I, I use happiness of the population and empathy. Um, happiness of the population for things like government programs and, and laws and things like that and personal and empathy to guide my own personal ac actions. What is the most empathetic response I can have towards my fellow human being and to as many things as possible um, that may or may not be intelligent, dogs, cats, cows, etc. cetera. Um, that's what I use is to, for, for my guiding principles. So for me to just decide to chop off Matt's head is objectionable because People like Matt, they love Matt, they would cost him great pain, to, or his loss would, would cause pain. Um, that would not lead to the general betterment or more happiness in society, especially this, those members of society who know Matt. But also, it's one of the least empathetic things I can do. I, showing no empathy for Matt and his life and who he is. Now, if Matt was on his deathbed and was asking to be killed, and the only way to do that that's a different story. That would, might be the most empathetic action I could have is to help Matt end his own life if he's in great pain and, and has no hope of getting out of it. Yeah. Um, so using those two things, and I'd be willing to bet that if you look at your own life and your own moral choices, that you're doing something similar. You're looking at the empathy. Well, that's kind of Why do you at. not lie? Yeah, that's kind, yeah. That's kind of, so here, here, Aaron, you were getting ready to object that you don't think that I have a, a good reason to object to what we've defined as murder, right? Hello? Oh, yes. So, so, so no, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to clarify. If you say, I'm trying, I'm trying to clarify, so you're, you, you, were, you, you started to object that I don't have a, you don't think that I have a good reason to not or a good foundation to not murder, right? 
actually, I was saying I didn't know based on whatever label you might put on you. I, I can assume that you live in Texas and that you're in the society and that you think murder is wrong. I could infer that, but that's not a universal truth across humanity. There is, so I don't care about a universal truth across humanity. I'm not convinced that there is such a thing as a universal truth across humanity. But what the thing is, you're objecting to my foundation for morals while you have presented a worse foundation, which is that you're going to accept whatever your own personal understanding of a religious document is. And that's a garbage reason. That's a garbage foundation. That is that is nothing more than just, well, it's my opinion. Mine, and I've given a lecture many times before on the superior to secular morality, is about the well-being of thinking creatures. That this is the, the primary foundation which spawns us with individual autonomy and liberty and freedom and where we evaluate the consequences of our actions to determine whether or not it produces a better world or a worse world with respect to well-being. I'm not saying, oh, I just think this is right and therefore the end of it. I actually have put some thought into it and I have considered secular moral systems. And you, on the other hand, have rejected those, accepted a theistic moral, moral foundation, which is your own invention. You have nothing more than these are the things I agree with and these are the things I don't. So of the two of us, who has a better foundation for morality? I think that I, I'm not arguing whether you have a better foundation for morality. What I'm arguing is that at least I have a label that you can understand them. I don't give a fuck. Like a lot of what I believe. If you're not, if you're not calling in, if you're not calling in to discuss, it, Aaron, stop. If you're not calling in to discuss why one moral foundation is better than another, why are we wasting time? Because I don't give a rat's ass about a label. Okay, I was trying to explain why I was, why I believed in a God rather than not believing in a God, because I don't but think- But you haven't, you have, I think, so if you rewind this call, at no point have you made any sort of remote attempt to describe why you believe in a God over not believing in a God. What you've done is said that you're uncomfortable with the prospect of not having some sort of absolute universal foundation for morality, and therefore you accept propositions of theism that are consistent with what you think and reject the ones you don't, but you haven't given one even hint of a reason for why you believe in a God. That is why I believe in a God, because there That's is a shitty reason. Base morality. Yeah, so Aaron? I mean, yeah. that, Aaron, let me ask you this. Are you saying that your morals, that Morals have to come from God? Not at all. And that's why God exists. A, I think that the reason why I'm a theist rather than atheist, and yes, I'll say Christian rather, why I don't believe in a God, is because I don't have any... Basically, if you tell me you're an atheist or a humanist, it doesn't tell me anything about what you believe or why you believe it other than that you don't believe in a God. Okay, so you don't, you don't, you don't really care then. From me. It, it's becoming clear. Well, you don't care about what's true and you don't care about what you believe. What you want is a comfortable label that you can use so that you're not ostracized by society. When, when people say, hey, what do you believe about this? You can say, well, I'm a Christian and let them infer whatever they want about it. Well, that's cowardly crap. Humanism, by the way, yeah. if I say I'm a humanist, that does tell you quite a bit about what my position is yeah. on morality. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> humanist has a definite set of values. That that I that don't believe in everything in the Bible, and for then you to say that I don't care or I'm cowardly because that you, does, you that don't. Hard, but I do have a. You don't care about what's true because you, you've demonstrated that repeatedly. What you said was you were uncomfortable with the proposition of not having something you could point to and label. As your th as your as a moral foundation, as but a having some point. having something you can point to and label as your moral foundation is not an argument for the existence of God. It's not an argument for believing in a God. It is an argument for I really don't want to call myself an atheist because I'm not comfortable with dealing with the difficulties that come with people asking me about my morality. So I'm going to take a shorthand, even though what I'm really doing is just using my own brain and rejecting a good chunk of what Christianity advocates. You're not a Christian. I don't complete. I don't completely disagree with you, Matt. I just. My question is why? Like you gave the example of cutting the head off of a person and that being wrong. Why is that more wrong than eating meat by being? Who, who said anything at all about more wrong? I, I I came up with an example. Okay, here you need to understand this. So stop talking and listen closely. 
when you talk about morality, we tend to give easily evaluated issues. We don't go into the nuanced positions. We try to find common fucking ground. And I was hoping that murder would be common ground that we could actually work with. And it kind of was. And so you, instead of coming up with any sort of rebuttal or any sort of defense or anything else, now you want to talk about why is it more wrong to cut off a person's head than it is to eat meat? Was your entire purpose to come in and advocate for ethical vegan position? Because if so, you've been arguing garbage from the beginning. I'm just wondering if that's going to continue. No, you're probably right. I mean, that's probably my biggest sticking point with with morality is well, your biggest sticking point for morality is veganism, right? It is, yes. Goodbye, you dishonest okay. caller. I, uh, oh wait, I, I let Jim say whether or not we should hang up. Go ahead. <laughs> well, what I was going to point out was oh, simply okay. this: the the way you can objectively once once if we assume the subjective standard of policies that attempt to achieve the greatest possible happiness for the entire population and personal empathy to guide our own individual actions. The murder versus eating meat can, is actually pretty easy to figure out um, because murder a human being is going to cause a lot more grief than murdering an animal unless that animal is a pet, regardless of species, whether you have a pet pig, a pet cow, a pet octopus, a pet porcupine, killing a pet is going to have more of a negative impact and be less sympathetic to the person who owns the pet or, you know, ownerships is a, is a testy word with pets with some people, but I could actually go through and make that kind of determination as to whether or not uh, that is the most empathetic thing. In terms of policy, I can look at the effect of killing a person versus say killing a cow for me. But that also leads to an interesting question, because if you're looking at, say, in particular, killing cows, for a pound of meat, you need, what, 10, 15 pounds of input to get a pound of meat? That is not effective economics. Um, when you look at everything that goes into that, um, it is not effective economics. And so you could make an ethical choice based on that. And so, like I said, you've got to start with that subjective point. And you can start with the subjective point that some god is good by definition therefore everything he wants is good she only do what god wants or we can pick and then you can't really measure anything because sometimes god wants you to take slaves sometimes he doesn't sometimes god wants you to lie sometimes he doesn't um or we can choose something that we can actually have some measurement of um where we can have at least a finger in the wind type estimate of whether or not is the population happier today than it was yesterday? No. Um, or in the case of murdering somebody, how much of a, a hole in people's lives, how much unhappiness have we caused by doing that? Um, Charles Manson being murdered is going to have a different impact on society than, say, Matt, right? So we can actually start looking at these things objectively with those objective standards. And so that's why I use those is because they're very, very effective. When we look at, hap you know, Matt says well-being, I say happiness. What's the difference? I think it's easier to measure happiness than well-being. Um, well-being needs a lot of things to uh, be described in addition to. Um, but happiness, we don't. We know that from an 80-year study that, that human happiness is directly related to the number of connections in your life, the number of human connections in your life. Um, and from that, we can infer that you need you know, physical and mental health, et cetera, we can make all these inferences to where we need to go. And so it becomes a way of fixing problems. But if you go with the Bible and the only thing that's wrong with you, the only thing that you really have is eternal punishment after you're dead, or you have a reprobate mind and there's nothing you can do, where are you? You don't, you're not going anywhere because why do we have psychology? Why do we understand why people do what they do? Um, and we have much better options today than we did back in the Bronze Age. So that's what we that's what I use and that's why I use it is because I can now begin to at least put some numbers or put some metrics on it and see whether or not I'm moving closer to my goal of making 
the entire planet of humans happier, um, et cetera. So that's why I use what I use. No God is required for this. And I would, I would counter with anything in the Bible that the Bible is right in the same way that, that a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, not a digital one, obviously, but, um, yeah, this is in that same way, you know, you get somebody who calls in to say, Oh, I went back and forth between theism and atheism. And now I'm a Christian. And when we finally get down to the, the nuts and bolts of it, it's, you know, actually you're, you're cherry picking whatever you want out of the Bible and rejecting things. Like, I'm sure that you're going to reject what it says in Romans 14 too. Do you even know what it says in Romans 14 too? I'm going to bet you don't. I do not know. Yeah, it says that one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another person whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. So the Bible is saying that as a vegetarian or vegan, you're weak. Also, the Bible gave, according, according to God, God gave all of those meat things to us to eat. So what you're doing is going with the Christianity thing and getting rid of any verse that you don't agree with, including all the dietary stuff and everything else. You have invented your own fucking religion. And you've tried to call in to pretend like you're on stronger moral foundation and you have screwed it up start to finish. I apologize. That was not my intent. My intent was to discuss morality as it relates to theism versus atheism. Like I honestly don't I've never We, we, we did that. That conversation is over the second you admit that you don't have any better foundation than the rest of us. That's fine, but I, I would like some sort of help with the morality argument from it. From your perspective, that's why I called in. I thought I made it clear to the screener, but I was trying to give you the reason I believe what I believe. Yes. And the reason I believe this stuff is because I wasn't able to find, like, my sticking point is morality. You didn't find it. You didn't find it with theism either. You just lied to yourself and convinced yourself that you found it. The thing that you're missing, theism isn't giving you, and you're not even using theism to give it to you. You're just creating whatever religion you want. You're using your brain to evaluate situations and come to what you feel is moral or immoral based on your own thoughts and feelings. Congratulations. Welcome to the world. You don't need to adopt theism for that. The problem is I used God as a basis point that I was... No, no you didn't. You are God. You did not, no, you did not use God as a basis point because you can't point to one thing that God actually said or one thing that God actually advocated. All you can do is point to things that you think God advocated. And when there's two things that God advocates, like, hey, don't kill people, and hey, you can have slaves, you're now cherry picking between the two. So that's not God writing your morality, that's you, own it. Well, that's because God isn't the one who wrote the Bible. Like humans wrote the Bible. so I don't care who wrote the I, Bible. You, you just, you're the one who's claiming that you're hanging it on God. What access do you have to God? How many conversations have you had with God? God. Huh? None. I only have the concept right. of God. If you have no access to God, then the you are lying God. when you say that, you're, that God is your foundation for morality. No. So I'm using what I've read in the Bible as my base. Then, then don't you dare fucking right. object when I point out to the Bible that God didn't write the Bible. You Can you even argue honestly? You start with, it's God, and I point out problems with the Bible, and you say, God didn't write the Bible. And then I say, okay, what access do you have to God? And you're like, oh, I don't have access to God. I'm using the Bible. You are talking yourself in awful circles. Just own the fact that you have thoughts about morality, and they're no more grounded than anybody that you're objecting to. But you don't have God as your foundation. You don't have the Bible as your foundation. You have you as your foundation, which I think we've thoroughly demonstrated by now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I have agree. the concept. I have the concept of God, and I don't give a shit. I have a concept right. of a unicorn, and it's pooping ice cream right now. But it doesn't do a fucking thing for the world. Please grow up. But I don't know anything about. Yeah, we were going in circles. Yeah. It's the concept of God. God's not the foundation of morality. The, my concept of God. Well, congratulations. My concept of God says your concept of God is shit. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> my concept uh, of God is better because it's not advocating the bad stuff. What's that? Yeah, that's it. Only if we had uh, unicorns pooping ice cream, that would be kind of awesome. I know. I've seen it on TV. It must be real. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's, uh, we're moving on here to Carl in Ontario, who has a purpose in life from an atheist perspective. How are you doing, Carl? I'm well. How are you guys doing today? Outstanding. 
pretty darn good. I'm delighted to hear that, Matt. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I interrupted you. Uh, Matt, I just want to let you know, of all my heroes, you only come second to Christopher Hitchens in my books. Well, so Hitchens heard... and I will both tell you the same thing. Stop having heroes. It's just that he's dead and can't say it right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but... you obviously don't know Matt that well. Yeah. Um... I don't want to be anybody's <laughs> yeah, fucking yeah, hero. Obviously. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Um, I meant it more colloquial anyways. I got you. Um, I, I'm, I'm just being pedantic, yeah, which yeah. actually, by the way, puts me in good company because at the Texas Free Thought Convention in, I think it was 2011, which was Hitchens' last, or it might, it might have been after that, it was the last uh, one, somebody came up and, and, and to him and said, oh, I'm a huge fan, and Hitchens proceeded to give them a lecture on the origin of the word fan as fanatic and how he didn't want fanatics following him. Fanatic. Yeah, and I'm just like, dude, all he was really saying was he liked you. Yeah, and it's the trolley dodgers uh, thing. Uh, my, yeah. my degree is in history, so I know a little bit about word entomology and whatnot. Anyways, gentlemen, the reason I actually called in today, um, I've heard many times, including on your show, because I watch your show, pardon the uh, expression, religiously, um, and throughout the show I often hear people talk about, well, without God, what gives you meaning? What gives you purpose? Um, and a significant emotional experience happened to me a couple of weeks ago. If I choke up when I'm talking to you, I apologize ahead of, uh, ahead of what I'm about to say. Um, I was on leave a couple of weeks ago. Well, this would have been the Tuesday before last. And I was riding my gold wing up here in Canada down the Trans-Canada Highway. And I saw across the street a vehicle start to cartwheel. And it cartwheeled and it came onto our side of the median. And just as it cartwheeled, there was a big plume of black smoke. So the vehicle came to rest upside down on our side. So I jumped off, uh, off the main part of the highway onto the median, tore down the median on my motorbike, and I was the first person on the scene. So I jumped off and I said, um, hey, my name's Captain Fitzgerald Sloman. I'm with the Canadian Armed Forces. I'm here to help. Is everyone okay? And I heard crying of a little child in the back of the vehicle which was now crushed on its roof and in the front I could hear a woman muffled saying yes I'm okay but my child well that got me really hard so I um summed or I took a look at the situation and I started to give people direction that it started to get out of their vehicles you know you call the police blah 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 and I said does anyone have any crowbars we got to get them out of here right away so we, uh, to cut a very long story short, broke the back window. I dived into the back of the vehicle, and I extracted a two-year-old child out of her car seat. And it was very, very difficult. And by the way, part of the reason I called you is this is cathartic for me. So I got the child out, and there was another lady who was a first aider, and she started to look after the child. Then there was the lady in the front of the vehicle, and I have claustrophobia, but I wasn't even aware of it because it was really tight because the whole vehicle had uh, been smashed down. So I grabbed her hands. I said, now squeeze my hands. She squeezed them, so I thought, okay, she's not paralyzed. I said, okay, you're going to have to undo yourself from your seat. I can't get up that close. So she ended it, and there was smoke and dust in the freaking car. So I dragged her out on her back and got her out of the vehicle. The other lady was looking after the young child. And so I then proceeded to do first aid on her. Anyway, uh, the EMS people show up, everything's great. Um, and they were concerned about me because they knew I was visibly shaken up. Uh, I hopped on my motorbike and I left and about an hour or a half an hour later, I pulled over and started to cry. Um, since that experience, and uh, because I'm in the military, the military has now found out about it, and they are looking, you know, at, okay, what happened? We want to know because, you know, there could be some fallout in a positive way because of what you did. So I uh, calmed myself down, and since then, I've been looking back on it. And what I've deduced this is following to any of the theists out there who turn around and say, what gives you purpose in life? What is the meaning? Why are we here? My deduction is that I am here to try to protect you and my fellow human beings from the universe, which is trying to kill them. And that is what my purpose is. So I don't need a God. And the whole time I went through the extraction of the people in the vehicle, there was never once I thought about a supreme being, a deity, or anything else. All that went through my head is where there are two people in here that are in jeopardy of dying. 
And unless I do something about it and act quickly, they are going to die. So as an atheist, I look at this from the position that that is my responsibility to you, Matt, to you, Jim, and everyone around me, that as a person with a conscience, compassion, and empathy, I will do what I have to do to protect you. And by doing so, that is the purpose of why I am here. That's what I wanted to tell you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy that you, yeah, you uh, managed to... And I knew there wouldn't be much... You knew there wouldn't be much what? Pardon me? Uh, I was saying something, and then you said you, you knew there wouldn't be much, and I didn't know what to say. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I didn't think there'd be much discussion because we're all atheists and we all kind of get it. No. But I just threw that out there because I wanted the theists to understand that, look... Um, I'm a compassionate, caring person without a God. I don't need a God to make me do what we call the right thing. And it's interesting that I'm coming in after the last conversation where about morality and everything else. I would argue that I did the morally right thing by stopping to help those people. And it did not take a God. It and, and I'm glad me. what I was saying was I'm glad that you've found a, a purpose and a meaning in your life. Your purpose isn't necessarily my purpose or anybody else's. I mean, I, I would probably phrase things better, but I'd like to think that any decent person would do the same thing in a similar situation. Um, but maybe not. Maybe some of them, I don't know, need some prodding from a purported God. I, I'm not convinced that's the case. I'm convinced that most people, if they are allowed to understand the consequences of actions and exercise their empathy, that that the empathy that Jim was talking about, uh, stuff like that's going to happen. And it doesn't, need, I, I don't even have to look at it as like, oh, this is my whole meaning and purpose in life. But yeah, it's fine. Right. I, fair, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I think it was because it was a significantly ex, uh, emotional experience that it got me thinking about purpose and what we're here for and why we do what, what it is that we do. And that was just the conclusion that I drew of it for me. Um, and that helps me to rationalize uh, my being, why I am actually here. But gentlemen, I thank you so much for your time. I wish you all uh, the best in what I call a train wreck of a country right now. We had 105 new people who passed away from COVID today or got COVID today. You guys got 30,000. Please don't reelect the same boob that you had from before. And I Yeah, okay, we, we have to stop you now, Carl, because you've crossed way too many lines to allow me to keep allowing you to talk on the air. So, for the record, while the callers can say whatever the hell they want, as a 501c3 nonprofit educational corporation, we're not going to be endorsing candidates either way. We are going to talk about various issues. I already mentioned that in Austin we're still on stay-at-home type stuff, uh, but we're not going to go down the, the, the political trail on this show. All right. Did you – well, here, let's do this. Mark in Florida, you're on with Jim and Matt. How are you? Matt, it is a great pleasure to speak with you, and uh, Jim, it's great to see you today, too. I'm doing great, and hope you guys are as well. Yeah, it yeah. says here you had a question about kind of like um, how much evidence is required and why should you withhold belief until that standard's met? Yeah, that's right. I've listened to a lot of, uh, okay. I've listened to a lot of your stuff and been very impressed with the work you do, and uh one of the things I've heard you say quite often is that the time to believe a proposition is when there is sufficient evidence yeah. to support that proposition. And so my question is, what is the standard of proof that we ought to apply before we're uh, willing to accept a proposition or before we're willing to believe? It depends. It depends on the proposition. Not all propositions are okay. created equal. Okay. I'm going to do a start with one that. Can I can I throw one out that's a little bit easier? What? Can I throw one out that's a little easier to understand than uh, a little more generally agreed upon than than God. Say, for example, I believe that there is intelligent life spread throughout the universe, and Why? that intelligent life exists on billions of planets throughout Why? the universe. What what what's your evidence that compels you to believe that? Well. Uh, when you say, why do I believe something, I think there's uh, the honest answer, and then I think there's the rational answer. And the honest answer is one that I don't often hear on your program, which is that uh, it satisfies... Uh, Hang on. 
First of I all, the honest answer hey, hey, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to mute you for a second, and then I'll take you off mute because I don't want this. To get, so first of all, for me, the honest answer and the rational answer should be the same if we're talking about an honest person. However, when you say that you don't usually hear the honest answer on our program, uh, that's a little disturbing. So w do you think we're being dishonest here or are you talking about callers? But at the end of the day, all I asked was, why are you convinced? We can't have a discussion about what you should be convinced of until you explain why you're convinced. Okay, there's a difference between being convinced and having a belief, so... No, there's not. No, there's not. Believing simply means that you are convinced that the proposition is likely true. Okay, I'm convinced that intelligent life is... I understand that. The Why? What is the evidence that means that you should be convinced that there's intelligent life scattered throughout the universe? Okay, you just asked two different questions, Matt. You asked why, and then you asked what is the evidence. Yes, it, it's possible It's possible that you could be convinced w without evidence, but I would just dismiss that. So I'm wanting you to explain why you're convinced, and hopefully it's actual evidence. I don't have actual evidence. I'm convinced. Then why, why would you? So basically you're saying you're convinced of something when you don't have evidence? Why would you do that? Matt? Most of the people on the planet are... Convinced. I don't give a shit about most of the people on the planet. I don't give a shit about people who are holding wrong, wrong beliefs. I'm asking, why would you be convinced of something while you acknowledge that you don't have evidence for it? Because it satisfies an emotional need. Thank you. Is that a good, is that a good way to go about determining whether or not something is true or whether or not something should be believed? Well, can we get to my question, which is what no, is the standard no, proof? no, we can't. Well, we're talking about the standard of proof. We're talking about we're talking it. about the standard of proof. Do you right think now? that okay. because it feels yeah. an emotional need is a good reason to be convinced something is true? So, what is the standard of proof that all I just asked a question? You keep going back to what's the standard of proof? I cannot answer that because each 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 proposition is different. I'm asking a question, which is, why do you think that it's okay and good to be convinced of something while acknowledging that you don't have evidence for it? Because that's the world we live in. No, it's this not. Okay, uh, you might, you might so, as well be saying, look, all the village idiots believe stuff without evidence, therefore I'm on good, in good company for believing stuff without evidence. But that is, not what, that is not what reason and epistemology are about. Sound epistemology doesn't, doesn't go around going, you know what, if a bunch of people believe stuff, I'll just go ahead and do it too. That's called an argumentum ad populum, which is a logical fallacy. I understand yeah, epistemology, Matt. What I'm telling you is... Evidently you don't. You are trying... You're, you are describing a world that you wish to live in. And no. People base their beliefs. No, no. Oh, Mark, okay, okay. No, so it, it, and partially, it, you're partially correct. I do wish I lived in a world where people were fucking rational instead of saying they believe stuff without evidence. Yes, I do wish I lived in that world because that's the preferable world. That's the world you live in. Now, Mark, I actually agree with you, but my standard of my evidence is a little bit different than yours. I have a degree of confidence, I won't say a high degree of confidence, so we're not the only intelligent life in the universe. And that is based on, one, the size of the universe is, as far as we know, infinite or so close to it, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's much larger than we can see for certain. And two, it's happened once, and it seems likely to have happened a second time, but I can't actually discount the fact that we may be a complete stroke of luck within the universe. Do you see how what I just said is different from you going, it feels right? Because I can change your emotional state by changing the temperature. Because people get yes, cranky I, when it gets hot. Yes, and that's... That's, so that, that's the standard of evidence. Uh, and I agree with that. Uh, but it has nothing to do with emotion or how I feel or it makes me feel more complete or anything about emotion. It's simply a statement of facts with enough language to acknowledge that I don't have anything stronger than it's possible well, or probable. There's a, lot of evidence, there's a lot of evidence from cognitive brain science and human psychology that demonstrates that people do base their beliefs on I, their emotions. John, Mark, and Mark. Then, and Mark, then oh, yeah. Mark, they develop Mark, arguments to Mark, those Mark, you're fucking muted now. You can talk to me all day long about how people go about making up their mind.
That is not what epistemology is. Epistemology is about how people should make up their mind. Pointing to all the people who are irrational doesn't mean that you being irrational as well suddenly turns you into rational just because you're just as irrational as other people. That's not what epistemology is. That's not what sound reasoning is. So stop telling me what I already know, which is that there's a bunch of people out there who don't know how to reason and don't know how to determine whether or not something is believable. I already know that. You're one of them. Okay, so if we could return to the starting point. No, ask, you, what is the, no what is I'm going to drop you in just a second because I'd like you to stop going back to the starting point and acknowledge what's actually been said. Okay, I acknowledge what has been said. That's not quite how that works, but go ahead. So, if I were to offer you a definition of God and ask you, because you're, I've heard you say many, many times that the time to believe a proposition is Correct. There's sufficient evidence to believe Correct. it. But we're not able to establish what sufficient evidence is until we establish a standard of proof. Is it probable cause? Is That's not my problem. That's the problem of the people who are saying that they're justified in believing in a God. It's not my fault that the God you believe in doesn't have the ability to meet the standard of evidence that would be required to accept it. That's not my problem. That's your problem and your God's problem. You yeah, don't know I mean, what, what my problem is because we haven't talked about the God that I believe. I know what your problem is. I've pointed well, it out multiple times. You think you're perfectly justified in believing something because it fucking feels good. And that's not how reason works. No, I didn't say I was justified in believing it. I said you that is the honest answer. Definitely did. Why I believe that's I yes. And you. yes, and that has nothing to do with epistemology. I can give you supporting evidence for what I believe in. Sure, define your God and for start presenting evidence. Okay, so we'll start with a definition of God. Okay. Universal, con universal consciousness, which is the ground of being. Uh, I have no idea what that means. I don't know what that, so first of all, I don't, know, I don't know how you would demonstrate a universal consciousness, but how do you demonstrate that a universal consciousness is the grounding of being? I, I don't, I'm not sure that being needs a grounding. Being just is. Well, I, right, and so now we're circling back to where we were before, which is that I cannot demonstrate it, and I have no intent okay. of demonstrating it. Good, then I'm going to hang up on you if Jim's okay yeah, with it, because care. I'm not interested in having yeah, conversation I don't care. with people. Who, well, once you say oh, you're not interested in trying to prove it, I don't really care yeah. anymore. I mean, that's like kind um, of the whole point of the fucking show is to call in and say, hey, here's what I believe in. Why? And when you say, I believe right. there's a universal consciousness that grounds all being, um, okay. I, I, have, I don't. Yeah, I have no idea what those words mean together. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's, uh, I mean, that's talking. Yeah. anyway. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Gene, you're on with, with uh, Matt and Jim. How are you, Gene? Hey, good. How are you guys? Hey, as a science Going teacher... Good. Do you think it's epistemologically sound to believe something because it feels good? Just wondering. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely argue. That's a big fat no. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just want to double check. You know, but who am I? I'm just appealing yeah. to a science teacher. I'm not appealing to philosopher. <laughs> I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> oh gosh. Hey, so thanks for taking my call. Uh, I've been, uh, been thinking about this one for quite a while, and I'm just asking anybody who would have a perspective on it. Um, obviously, as a, I actually teach Earth System Science, so we teach. Big Bang Theory and Earth's history and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I obviously have a few students who will say they don't believe me regardless of how I present it and not in a way of just to say, here's what it is, but sort of have the kids figure it out. And I always don't suggest I feel like a failure, but I do wonder what my role would be if I have a kid who walks out of my room and says, oh, I believe there's a flat Earth. Like I feel like I failed as an educator and, and let society down, yet people have the right to believe what they want to believe. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, sometimes you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Um, <laughs> yeah. For every, you know, it, 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 it's it's trite to say, but it's also true. Um, sometimes you just got to throw your hands up and go, I did the best I could. Um, was there a better way? Maybe, but you didn't know it at the time. Maybe in five years, you'll figure yeah. out a better way. Um, Matt makes yeah, it look fact, easy because he's been doing it for 15 years. 
So, the fact that people have a right to their belief doesn't doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or, not the, whether or not their belief is right. I don't care that somebody has a right to believe. You have a right to be offensive doesn't mean you're good to do it. You have a right to uh, be offended and express your offense, and it doesn't mean anybody has any justification for caring about it. You have a right to think that right is left and left is right. It's not it's not like we, anything we can do. We can't go in and fix broken brains like forcibly. All we can do is exercise reason and try to make people value that. And so when there's kids that come in, you know, and, and try to be disruptive in science class on behalf of creationist stuff saying, you know, like, the, the, were you there? Um, I, I'm almost tempted to say, you know, like, yes, I was there. Were you there? Because you'd need to be there in order to prove that I wasn't there. Okay, are we done with the stupid yeah. stuff now? Can we get back to actually learning the science? Because... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the kids are very polite. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not obnoxious about it at all. And I, I don't want them to write something or explain something just because you know, they think that's the right answer. And that's not at all the philosophy of my classroom. But at the same time, I, yeah, I, I realize there's other teachers that will interact with them and other adults, and, and they're only 14, 15 years old. Um, but I've heard, I've heard you specifically, Matt, just mention uh, you know sort of the failure of education. I don't. I don't argue that point. But at the same time, I'm like, well, what is my role when when that sort of I don't want to say allowed to happen, but it is. It's going to happen naturally. Um, it's, I don't know what the what the resolution to that is to, to kind of progress society. I mean, you know, a kid who goes into a university not believing in evolution. I mean, we're 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 in the we're in the dark ages here. Yeah, it's it's we, we have full grown adults with multiple degrees who who uh, are young yeah, there, There's a there's a full grown adult who has a PhD in geology that he got by lying basically pretending to agree with the science on geology just so that he could be a creationist with a PhD in geology. Works for the yeah, Discovery uh, Institute. So frustrating. Uh, very frustrating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I still appreciate your perspective, guys. I, I really do. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah, thanks. Good luck with it. For, for me, the biggest job of an educator is, is to make sure that you're doing your best to give kids the education that they need and deserve and to, to find the things that in, that inspire kids that make them want to learn about certain things and kind of reinforce that. I, I mean, it's the, I, you know, it's, it is the teach them how to think, not what to think kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I, I hope I'm doing that, but I appreciate it. I would agree. All right. Thanks, Gene. Appreciate it. Ah, oh, it's so difficult sometimes, you know, I, I don't have kids and I'm not a teacher in, in, in like a school or anything. Yeah. And, you know, I have uh, I have a niece and nephew and they have different interests. And I, you know, my girlfriend's got a six year old and, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what they're interested in as well. But it's this this thing about, oh, well, you they have a they come the students come in and they think they have a right to their beliefs. They're correct. They have a right. I can't. I can't take a belief away from somebody like, right. I can't forcibly remove, you know, remove something from somebody's consciousness. And even if you could, it wouldn't be ethical. Yeah. So. The difference is, is that, you know, um, you have a right to your beliefs, but whether or not your beliefs are right or something that you should care about. And if you don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Well, there's a degree of arrogance that comes with thinking you have capital T truth. Um, and that, you know, you have this truth that nobody else does um, that I, I don't get anymore um, as an atheist because, you know, we can't prove that we're not a brain in the vat, much less um, anything else for absolute certain um, about the world we live in. So, yeah. So we got uh, Joe in Lebanon. You're on with Matt and Jim. How are you? Hi, guys. Hi, how you doing? Very good, very good. Thanks. Uh, I I am I live in a country where uh, I probably could be killed if I was found out that uh, I was talking to a show like this. Well, let's hope not. Um, <laughs> I hope not. I I I am a 50-50 fifty 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 I don't know um, what that means. I, I was. Uh, well, 50-50 means I've been, uh, I, I studied in a theological seminary for, for a half a decade, um, and uh, I'm at a crossroads, and I don't know where I'm going from now. So uh, declaring myself uh, 
On the other side would mean uh, if, if, if I told anyone, I would probably be shunned by, by the society and probably, uh, I don't know what would happen. Well, I wouldn't do it then. This is the kind of society, I know, I understand. It, it's yeah. the kind of society where, where you, 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 you simply cannot say who you are and what you believe and what you don't believe. Uh, because uh, you, could, you could be physically hurt if you do that. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, I have just very, very quickly two questions. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, a constructive uh, criticism for, for uh, one of your presenters, Dan Baker. And the thing is with Dan Baker is I've been watching the show for, for maybe two years now. Um, the thing with Dan Baker is that he laughs off too many things. You know, every every time that the theist says something, he just laughs it off. And this is not the way to deal with theists. Uh, maybe you understand what I mean. So I'm I'm sure that Dan is watching and listening. And and this is a uh, you know this is just a, just a reminder for you, Dan. Don't do it this way. This is not the way it's done. You don't laugh things off. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to stop us I'm going to stop us Joe because first of all Dan's not here or Don sorry I can't I, with Dan his I, name I, Don Baker Don's not here to defend himself and Don's no longer a regular uh, co-host on the show okay. although we may have him back from time to time I'd love to but instead of just calling in to critique someone who used to be on the show do no, we no, have no, that's not what I'm calling okay well then let's okay. get to that part. So, uh, so Yes. So the second part is, you know, that every every uh, major religion is probably started by someone uh, who is uh, an eccentric person. So let's say um, Jesus or Muhammad or Joseph Smith. Uh, so every time there is someone who starts uh, a religion by 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 pretending to do things and see things and and do things and and pretending to be a prophet of, of sorts. So the question is, for example, in, 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 um, in the case of Joseph Smith, for example, we, we probably know that this was a fraud. If you ask any Christian or any Muslim or any, any other denomination or any other religion, they would say, yeah, this is a fraud and this is not the way it works and this is not a, it's not a prophet and uh, this is bullshit and yada, yada, yada. And you know that, that 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 that's the way it is, and and this is just 150 years ago, and now it's a religion that has 100 uh, has 15 million followers or something. Now, every other religion that's out there is started by somebody like this. So my question is, and after this question, you can you can take other calls and and you can go on. But my question is, you know, Saint Paul. Uh, quote unquote, is someone who has had uh, uh, Damascus Road experience, and he and the call dropped. Oh, so all that time talking about Don Baker, Don, and, yeah. and the, the call screen thing. Basically, the the question was, uh, was Saint Paul honest and accurate? Don't know. I don't either. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to know uh, what the the experience was he had, and we can disagree with how he interpreted it. Um, but I don't know that we can disagree that he had it. That's why personal experience is such a frustrating, uh, such frustrating evidence. Yep. Is you had an experience. The question is, is was your interpretation of that experience the correct one? I mean, we have a hard enough time sometimes with that with just human to human interaction. Right. Uh, you may have an experience of, hey, how you doing? I was friendly to this person. Other person went, oh my God, this guy's terrifying. Yeah. Um, you both have the same event, two different experiences. Both experiences are valid on the same event. Now you start throwing in the supernatural God and the mystic and, and stuff we can't actually prove. Yeah. It's, it's, so the, the question though, <laughs> to say, how accurate is this report? Well, you can't know how accurate the report is until you know what the thing that occurred was. It's like saying, you know, right. the Bible says that this particular well was 
nine feet across. How accurate is that? I don't know. Can, do we have a well we can measure? If, you, if there's nothing, you know, apart from, oh, we find this person truthful. I mean, this is literally the debate that I had on Friday with Jonathan McClatchy, where it was, right. hey, we find the gospel authors to be truthful on mundane things, so we're going to accept them on these extraordinary things. I'm sorry, but, you know, much like the previous caller who wanted to go with what felt good, uh, just saying, I find this person you know, truthful, and therefore I'm going to believe then that Jesus rose from the dead. That's not sound epistemology. Though. I don't know how to yeah. tell something. Exactly. And somebody could, somebody could believe it's true and it's still not be true because we don't know how they arrived at their conclusion. Yep. Cause yeah, their, their epistemology could be off, um, or their understanding of, of what it could be. So, you know, uh, we have this problem with, uh, what is it? Cubits. What the heck is a cubit? Nobody knows. Um, oh, we kind of do. Ham we we just don't know how long it is. Cubits are like one of the, well, cubits are one of those. It's like from your nose to your fingertips type of things. Uh, you know, like a yard along those lines. But yes, oh. we don't have exact measurements. But right. Yeah. So yeah, it. Yeah, I I don't know how accurate he was. Um, I don't know if he just took a blow to the head. I don't know if he was drunk. I don't know if he was uh, taking some sort of drug. Um, don't know if he had a psychotic break. Yeah. Don't it's know. one of those things, you know, for me, I generally assume that someone is doing their best to honestly, honestly relay accurately what they experienced. However, that doesn't mean that yep. their description is in fact accurate. If somebody tells me I saw a ghost last night, um, okay, what do you mean you saw a ghost? What, what's a ghost look like? How did you determine it was a ghost? I, I, this person, I, I'm fine with accepting they experienced something last night and that the limitations of, of language and of their understanding means that the best description they can give is, I saw a ghost last night. But that doesn't tell me yeah. what it was. Yeah. And, and what's funny is that for ghosts and for anything else supernatural, we have no experts. We have people who claim to be experts, but they cannot demonstrate any expertise. No clergy person has an expertise in anything supernatural. They've never demonstrated that. What, the, what clergy people have an a expertise in is perhaps, perhaps knowledge of the holy text that they're going with or the history of their religion or in pastoring people uh, and ministering to people, those sorts yeah. of things. But they don't, they aren't tested, uh, um, they can't testify to the truth of the things that they believe. Yeah. Or they can testify. It's just they can't provide the evidence. But we got a couple others here that we could try to talk to today. Adrian in Texas. So the call is coming from inside the state. Um, welcome to the show. You're on with Matt and Jim. Hi, Matt and Jim. It's such an honor to talk to you all guys. Um, it's, uh, uh, I know you don't have a lot of time, so I'll just jump right into it. I believe in a... Uh, designer God because of the uh, evidence in nature that appears to be designed. And I guess... How do you tell the difference between... Uh, Adrian? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How do you tell that. the difference between something that appears to be designed and something that is designed? Um, the, uh, let's see, the, the usefulness of it. And well, the, uh, also, uh, the if compare it to other things that are around it. Well, I find a rock useful for hammering nails. Does that mean that the rock was designed to hammer nails? Yeah, I got a walking stick out in the backyard. Do you uh, think that grew uh, on a branch yeah. with the intent of being useful? As far as the rock being a nail, then uh, the moment that you use hammer. it as a nail, then that, that or as a <laughs> hammer, yeah, the moment that you use it as a hammer, then at that moment, it turns into something that was designed for hammering. Uh, no. Sense? No, because it's still a rock, and it was still created by natural forces uh, that we understand through ge geology. Uh, the fact that I'm using it as a hammer just means that I have found it, that that is the handiest thing to hammer a nail in with. Doesn't mean that it was designed for that purpose. Right, and could you could you but, use anything? Um, uh, is there anything around that you could use better as a hammer? Like, say, what, what difference like does that make? No, 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 Adrian, stop. So no, you're no. saying that the rock becomes an intentionally designed hammer the second Jim decides to use it as a hammer. Not only is that not the way 
design works because Jim didn't design that rock. But you've just defeated your own argument because every rock that hasn't been picked up and used as a hammer is clearly evidence for not being designed. Right, right. Rocks are not designed. I agree with you on that, on that point, that rocks are not designed. Okay, so if, you, if you're, you're going to use a rock as something, then... Uh, then I guess you, the person using the rock would would be the designer of that rock if they're using it for something. No, they they would be the person implying that is assigning the use to that rock, but they haven't designed it, right? If I have not chipped right. anything off of right. it, I have not and, applied any process to I mean, the rock, it's still the same rock it was before and, I picked it up. It's still the same rock after I use it to hammer in the nail and put it back down. It is it hasn't been designed I, I, I for think anything. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think I get what you're saying, but uh, I don't see how that uh, coates to, I mean, how that, uh, I don't see how that helps. <laughs> so it, it sounds to me like you are confusing design with purpose, right? So what is the purpose of a rock? Well, it doesn't have any purpose until I assign it, a human being assigns it a purpose. Uh, some birds may actually pick up a rock to drop it from a great height um or to use it to open something up they may use it as a tool chimpanzees may do the same thing so they're assigning purpose to the rock now to say that somebody designed it means that anything. i have taken a raw material and crafted it into something that i want yeah, to, that they, would be better could they use for anything purpose. like instead sure. of using the rock to open a shell for instance could they use something else to open the shell uh, around sure they, they, they could use any the, object right. for the purpose they could use any object with similar qualities for the same purpose because so purpose is not design is helpful i just don't see how, what how what you're saying is helpful to what i'm saying because if you could just well, what's the difference, in your mind what's the difference between purpose hammer? and design what's the difference between purpose and design purpose and design um, what is the difference between uh, purpose and design? Uh, I guess uh, I would only know about design right now. I mean, uh, like design would be. Oh, see, because you're, you're literally, the term. literally, when we asked you to define design, you included that it was something for a purpose. That's one thing, yes. And then the other thing is that it's different from everything else that it's around in nature. Okay. Well, so, so well, we're going back so to purpose. In a forest, what does purpose mean? All right. Hmm? Uh, it's What's the difference useful. between purpose and design? It can, be, it, it can be used useful for something. And then design is actually just, uh, is purpose is what how we define design. Name something that's not designed. No. Name something that's so. I'm, I'm gonna let you do that. I just want to know if he can name something that's not designed. A rock. I mean, I think we just said that. No, because you said okay. that if Jim picks up the rock and uses it, now it has a purpose, and that means it was designed. Yeah. After Jim picks it up, yeah, but uh, before uh, that, is, it didn't okay. have any purpose. All yours, Jim. This is way wow. too stupid this, for me. Yeah, this is where you're getting purpose and design confused. I have not changed any aspect of the rock other than its purpose. The rock before I picked it up had no purpose whatsoever. It just sat there. I picked it up to use it as a hammer. I changed its purpose, but I did not change the design of it. Right? I didn't I didn't shape it. I didn't do anything to it other than pick it up and bring it back down with some force. I didn't design it. I didn't put any effort into forming its shape. The hammer. Did you use right. it? Right. I'm saying I changed the purpose, but I did not design it. I changed the purpose, okay, but did that, not design it. At that moment is when it becomes a hammer. Do you get it? Now? Yes. The purpose becomes a hammer, okay. not the design. Yes. This is why I'm asking what the difference in your mind is between the purpose of a thing and the design of a thing. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you made the rock, you just made the hammer. Uh, you mean no, I, I repurposed the rock. I didn't make anything. The rock was already made. I you have made not changed it. 
No. No, he, he didn't. Used, he for used that a rock as a hammer. He did not make a hammer. Meanwhile, your second thing that we tell it by the fact that it looks something that it's different from the things surrounding it. If I just put a rock out in space, it's now different from everything around surrounding it. Does that mean it was designed? If you, I'm sorry, can you say that, that question one more time? You said that we recognize design by, by identifying something that is different from its surroundings. So if I pick up a rock and I put that rock in space so that it's different from its surroundings, does that mean the rock was designed? Well, could we look at, could we look does around? Does that mean the rock, rock was fucking designed? No, because there's other rocks. No, so, no I don't so you've know. given us two potential definitions for design. One is about purpose, which you don't understand and is a confused mess. And the other one is that it's something that's different from its surroundings. And I just demonstrated that something can be different from its surroundings. And even you acknowledge that it's not designed. So maybe you should go off and think about design, since your whole point is that things look designed. And what you decide is something that looks designed. You don't even have a good explanation for it. And you get undermined every time we ask a question. Yeah, how did you say that the rock was not was uh, like everything else around it? Or I didn't get that part because a I rock floating in rock space, a rock floating in space, is unlike everything around it. Correct. What about a comet? What about an asteroid? Aren't those rocks flying through space? Yes, they are. Are they near anything? They're in nature, and they're flying through space. Holy we can crap. see them. So. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Goodbye, Adrian. You get I'm, on a, I'm on a rock f flying through space. It's just that Adrian wasn't uh, wasn't following well enough for us to get to that. He but. may very well have been on a type of rock that, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to cast aspersions in our callers, but if you don't understand the difference between purpose and design, we can't really have a good conversation, and he was not getting the difference. Yeah. And if you think that we um, recognize design just because it's a little different from the things around it, I mean, that's somebody who 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 understood. Sorry, that's someone who heard Paley's watchmaker argument about finding a watch on a beach, but didn't understand it, uh, and just went right. To, oh, you know, oh, anything that's different from around it. So does that mean if I take a big dump in your bowl of soup, was the dump designed? You know. <laughs> Anyway, David <laughs> in Mexico. Just... David in Mexico, you're on with Jim and Matt, and it says here all it says is nature is God. So tell us about that and how we can know that. <laughs> no, no, actually, I think I was misread. Uh, I have an answer for Jim that he made at the beginning. Ah, good. About God lately. Cool. So Jim, I don't know if you know these authors. I have a list. There's six or seven, depending if you want to put the last one. The one at the beginning. I don't care about the authors. Tell me what they said. Um, it's a, it's Tell me what they a said. Metaphysics based on actual physics. So um, they have each, for example, Charles Spurs said, argued for the reality, not the existence of God. Um, and he does it from a. Oh, good. What was his argument? Uh, cognitive. That, uh, what was his argument? Hypothesis of, uh, hypothesis of God. Um, can be scientifically valid if we uh, look at it as a, as an incomprehensible object. So we use physics and we use uh, to ground our metaphysics. Another author in the 20s is uh, Whitehead, uh, who has uh, processed theology, and a lot of it um, is like the uh, metaphysics based on quantum mechanics. Another one is uh, Rosenzweig, a Jewish... Um, uh, um, theo theo theologian, theologist um, who wrote the Star of Redemption, and he thought of God as a traveling differential. Uh, do you know these authors? Uh, no, and there, I mean, you had one author who said something about quantum, so that sounds like, ooh, quantum stuff, let's add magic. Um, and uh, no, God is an equation? I'm not author. sure what yeah, I don't know how any yeah. of this. So basically, I don't know how any of this is an answer to what Jim said because Jim asked essentially, you know, what has theology done to 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 teach us more about God or or edify us more about the nature of the world? And what you're doing is citing someone like Whitehead, who's that's like process theism. No, and what white and what white? Are you gonna let me finish? 
what Whitehead thinks about God doesn't mean we've learned anything about God until Whitehead has been proven correct. You can cite as many different people running around saying, oh, there's a way that we might be able to massage our metaphysics with, with physics here. None of this is demonstrable to tell us anything at all about God. It's speculative at best. When they get the Nobel Prize, when they demonstrate the truth of their propositions, when we've confirmed that there is a God for them to be talking about, then we will have perhaps learned something about a God. But just pointing to people who've written what their thoughts are about God and in some way where they've massaged a definition to try to make it consistent with what we know about the world doesn't mean we've learned anything at all about God or about reality because of theism. I agree. I think you're misunderstanding the uh, uh, the propositions of Rosenzweig and Whitehead. They're not trying to prove God. Uh, I did. I mean, well, say, then, I didn't that's not actually, were. That doesn't answer my question. If if you just said they don't try to to prove God, then you're not answering my question at all. I think your question was, what have we learned about uh, God in in lately? And I had some more uh, current authors. Uh, but, um, no, well, none so, of the authors no, that you're pointing to have taught that. us. Yeah, I'm looking can for things that you can thing? prove. It, it, I'm looking for things that you can prove that has advanced our knowledge of God. Theories are not, or hypotheses mm -hmm. are not proof. You need evidence. And, and if what Matt says is true, because he's apparently read some of the, the authors, they you. haven't oh. offered any evidence. So if you don't have, if none of these authors no, have no. evidence, I think it's a confusion on your part of what metaphysics is. And metaphysics... I don't... Oh, I... Yeah, so yeah, I'm looking for proof. I don't care about metaphysics. metaphysics. I'm looking for proof. Grounded. Well, uh, I thought you were... Yeah, we need evidence. Uh, there's another one. Wolfgang Ether. If you I know, you want to write the authors, maybe... So, I don't want to write any of them down. I don't even know why you're citing them. All of those would be fallacious appeals to authority. It doesn't matter who you're referencing. What matters is the evidence. And if you want to talk about what philosophers or scientists have speculated about a god, that isn't going to get anywhere near answering Jim's question, which is about us having learned something. And, and learn something that's true, not just a hypothesis, not just speculation. There's no theory of God. Thinking, thinking, thinking that the only way to think about God is by trying to prove it, it it's, a, it's a show of ignorance on your No, no, David. Of, um, the, no, no, no. What's no, a show of no, ignorance no. is to suggest that Others? people... And, goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Um... It's not a show of ignorance to think that God needs to be demonstrated. That's a show of sound epistemology. Because until there's a demonstration of a God, all the navel gazing and hand waving and speculation about a God is absolutely fucking useless. You might as well be talking to us about Voldemort. Yeah. So last call for today, James in Nevada, you're on with um, Jim and Matt. How are you? Um. Hi, Jim and Matt. Um. I'm having a... I'm a nice day. Thanks. Cool. How can we help? Or what have you got for us? Because you, you wanted to talk about the possibility of a God. Well, yeah. Well, uh, with there being a possibility of a God, I would like to say that if there was a God, that I believe God would hope that people are attracted to reason and science and that they use common sense to overcome the problems that the world is facing and not just be on the sidelines saying that something will happen, but that they'll do something about it. Well, why do you believe this? Because you are rational and you're right with a lot of things that you say that throwing up your hands won't change anything. Things need to be done. And I believe if there was a God that he or he or she, whatever, they would defend you and say that you are correct, that saying something should happen and not doing anything about it isn't going to change anything, and that faith is not important and it's useless. Because you're not doing I, anything about... I'm I'm still not following your right. back. Yeah. Oh, and now we're getting you, you say that the, weird feedback. 
Yeah. You say it's possible that there's a God. It's also possible that pigs could fly out of my lily white backside. I'm not wearing a pig sty anytime soon. Um, what What is possible? And I'm I mean, not convinced that either of those are possible, by the way. I'm not convinced it's possible for pigs to fly out of Jim's butt. And I'm also <laughs> not convinced that it's possible that there's a God. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between possible and probable. Um. I just have the feeling that if there was a God, that God would be similar to you. And okay. our, our, our oh, feeling, our feelings, a valid pathway to truth. Thank you. We did this earlier. Go ahead. Yeah. The, our feelings, are, a valid pathway to truth. No. Our feelings, are, a valid, no. I have a feeling you're wrong. Yeah. That's fine. If you think that, that's fine. I have a feeling Matt's going to grow hair tomorrow. I am. That would be awesome. But, I can do it just by not cutting it off. Anyway, thanks, James. I appreciate All the call. Right. We're gonna we're gonna kind of close this out right now because um, I'm not convinced that James wasn't just you know like a fanboy trying to call in and tell me that I should be God. And I'm like, no, I absolutely shouldn't. Although I would be better than any God you've ever heard of. That that's undeniable. I would be far more fair. I would demonstrate to any of you that I exist, and I would not be punishing people for merely not accepting things that were hidden but yeah and let's face it that being better than uh, any guy that most people believe in is kind of a low bar so plus i i'm a bigger fan of some stuff than than most of the gods are like i'm a fan of like promiscuity like <laughs> maybe that may there are some gods that are probably not a fan of that um uh, i would be better there uh I, I would be better in the sense that you know perhaps um like I would remove the process of procreation um, away from just raw pleasure and power. And then there would never be an, any motivation for someone to rape someone else. So just, yeah. by, just by making that change to like, hey, here's how we procreate. Jim and I can, can say, you know what, Jim? I think I'd like to make a baby with you. Would you like to make a baby with me? And then if we agree, then we can each pluck a hair out of our head, put it in a, 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 a ball of spit and bury it in the ground in the backyard and a new version of us grows without anybody having to carry it, without any sort of violation of individual autonomy or personal space or anything. Yeah. That you want to have work. a baby with me like that, Jim? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't either. But what I do want to do is, first of all, uh, thank the crew who did a really great job, including through some technical snafus throughout all this. Oh, there's there's the bearded wonder at the bottom. Yeah, get right in there. And uh, as we're, we'll make announcements, uh, there, there's some changes to Facebook stuff coming up. Um, there's potential guests coming up. I want to make sure that everybody uh, who donated and contributes to the Atheist Community of Austin, both with um, uh, Patreon, YouTube, et cetera, we are greatly appreciative of all you. I would like to make sure that people are actually staying safe. We here at the Atheist Community of Austin are doing our best to stay safe. We're following the guidelines that are in our area, and we're going to continue to keep working to produce content, and we're grateful for the people who appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing almost all of you, because uh, Jim won't actually be here next week, but next week. What are we doing, man? What are we doing? No, 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 no. No, you're done.